artificial intelligence automation and work by Duran Simoglu and Pasquale Restrepo, published in as chapter eight in an NBR conference volume called The Economics of Artificial Intelligence in June of 2019. I'm not gonna go over the first two sections, which are just an executive summary of uh, sections A3 to A5, and in section A3, we're going to present the, uh, a simple model of automation, uh, then think about, you know, the types, the different types of technological progress uh, in that model and how that affects uh, labor demand and the labor share, and then end with um, adding some imperfections in the model and thinking about how uh, automation or technological progress uh, is amplified by the presence of these uh, imperfections. So a very simple model of automation uh, tasks and the demand for labor is motivated by this famous fanning out graph, which shows that for men, and this is in the US, since 1980, the, the wage structure has fanned out where you have increase, uh, increased um, so growth in the wages of the educated workers whereas the wages of less educated workers have uh, fallen, not just in relative terms, but also in absolute terms. You see that more recently, so since the late 1990s, 2000s, you see that there still was fanning out, but it became more asymmetric in that you still see high growth at the top. Um, so the wages of educated workers still growing fast, but the wages of the less educated workers um, still falling behind in relative terms, but uh, in the levels keeping up um, with uh, the mean or median. And so the same similar pattern for women, though somewhat perhaps less outspoken, the bottom line that um, we're gonna take away from this graph is that there's clearly episodes for both men and women uh, where wages have fallen uh, in, in, um, in real terms, in, in their levels. And um, this is something that uh, a simple two-factor constant returns to scale production function world uh, with factor augmenting technology cannot easily explain. The second fact that is puzzling for um, a two-factor CRS world is that the, the, what happens to the labor share. So since 2000, and this is again, so the, the US, um, the labor share has fallen. This is the aggregate labor share um, the red line is a counterfactual labor share where we keep the sexual composition of the economy constant. So what this red line is showing is that there's also significant declines um, of the labor share within sectors and um, particularly manufacturing. So, so why are these two facts puzzling uh, for a um, two-factor constant returns to uh, scale world? where you assume that there's factor augmenting technological change. And uh, probably the best reference here is the um, Asimoglu Restrepo 2018 uh, paper in the uh, AEA papers and proceedings, where they show that capital augmenting technological change uh, cannot explain declining wages um, for some workers. And it can also not explain the recent fall in the labor share for realistic parameter values. So, you know, the, the, the two facts that I've shown you on the previous uh, two slides are, are just not um, consistent with this, this two-factor CRS world in which there is capital augmenting technological change. When you turn to labor augmenting technological change, um, that cannot explain why there's declining wages if you assume realistic parameter values for elasticities of substitution and uh, the labor share it could explain the recent fall in the labor share uh, for realistic parameter values, but then Asimoglu Restrepo argue that it's, it's not very uh, convincing conceptually. So if you think of um, a, a production function with constant returns to scale using capital and labor, the way you want to think about um, technological progress in part is also by um, capital automating um, uh, jobs that workers do, um, rather than you know, thinking of technological progress as exclusively driven by um, a labor augmenting uh, progress. So that's why, you know, so given that with these, these, these recent facts 
about wages and the labor share are hard to uh, explain from, from the more traditional two-factor CRS uh, framework with factor augmenting technologies, uh, task-based frameworks have been uh, developed. And what the section 8.3 does is it gives you the, the simplest possible task framework um, that will um, be consistent with the facts that I've just shown you. I'm first going to talk about just what, what's the um, environment. Um, I'm going to introduce different types of technological change, not just factor augmenting technological change, but also other types of technological progress, and then derive the uh, equilibrium. So we're still in a static environment with, uh, where a unique final good Y is produced um, with a continuum of tasks on the unit interval, n minus one to n, uh, where n is just an exogenous parameter. And these tasks are combined Cobb Douglas. Um, and so what you get is final good Y is produced um, using uh, task YZ or task output um, YZ on the unit interval n minus one n where YZ is, is the service or the production of task Z. And I'll say a few more, more words about that on the next slide. And then we're also going to be choosing the final good as a numeraire, which means that um, its price or its price index, which is going to be equal to marginal costs that relate to this Cobb-Douglas technology in equilibrium are going to be set equal to one. So um, these tasks Z um, are, you know, so, so the support is between N minus one and N. And we assume that they're ranked such that they become increasingly more difficult for machines to do. And importantly, we're gonna assume an exogenous threshold I, which we call the frontier of automation possibilities, such that all tasks below I or equal to I uh, can and will be automated. And all tasks above I can only be done by labor. And so an increase in I will capture automation or what we're gonna call automation at the extensive margin. Now, these tasks Z themselves are produced using labor or capital. And um, all tasks Z below I can be produ produced either using uh, labor or capital, um, but they're perfect substitutes. So you're gonna only choose one and it will be uh, capital in equilibrium. And then all tasks Z above I are, are produced using labor LZ. And then the parameters are um, AL, ALK, ALAK, these are the factor augmenting technologies, and then you have the gamma LZ, the gamma KZ, or the task productivity schedules. I'll say um, a few more words about that in a second. And then LZ, KZ are just the quantities uh, of labor and capital used to produce task Z. The um, gamma L and gamma K, um, we assume that gamma LZ over gamma KZ is strictly increasing in Z. Uh, and this is an assumption about the relative productivity of labor and capital in doing different tasks. And this assumption is going to drive the allocation of labor and capital across task space based on, on uh, the gamma L and the gamma K and how they relatively uh, compare. So based on comparative advantage as in uh, ROI. And of course, what we will have in equilibrium is that um, all tasks Z uh, below I will be done by capital and we'll derive some, some conditions for you know, why all tasks below I are done by capital, not labor. Um, and all tasks Z uh, bigger than I will be, can only be done by labor by assumption. So here is a graphical representation of um, the equilibrium. So what we've assumed is that um, there is a continuum of tasks Z and tasks are ranked such that they become increasingly more difficult for capital to do. And so there is this exogenous threshold I, and we assume that all tasks above I um, are, can only be done by labor and tasks below I can either be done by capital or labor, but will be done by capital because the unit cost to produce task Z less than I, um, using capital, which is just R over AK gamma K Z, uh, which is this line here, is less than the unit cost of producing that same task using labor, which is just given by W over AL gamma L uh, Z. So, and of, in equilibrium, of course, so what you're then gonna have is that all tasks Z below I are gonna be done by capital and above I are by assumption 
uh, done by labor. We have the clearing um, our factory markets conditions. We assume that uh, labor and capital are supplied inelastically. And um, the sum of all the LZs have to add up to L and the sum of all the KZs um, has to be uh, K. And what we're going to do in the next um, couple of minutes is to uh, then think of what are the different types of technological progress and what's the equilibrium in this model um, and then the comparative statics so what is the impact of these different types of technological progress on labor demand and the labor share and then end with um, adding some imperfections to the model and see how um, technological progress and the impact of technological progress on um, on labor demand um, is amplified by um, or can be amplified by certain imperfections. So the types of technological change are easy to show graphically. So if we again start from this, this um, um, graph that shows the allocation of tasks to factors. Um, so you can think of different types of technological progress. So for example, you can think of labor augmenting technological progress that would be a change, an increase in AL or, or a gamma LZ for all Z. Um, you can think of this exogenous automation possibility frontier uh, moving to the right, um, which would capture you know, automation um, of you know, these tasks that are, you know, were done by labor, but um, for some reason can now be done by capital and you know can be produced cheaper um, using capital than using labor. Um, you can also think of uh, capital augmenting technological progress that's an increase in AK or gamma KZ for all Z less than I. And finally, you can also think of technological progress as a, a shift out of this N, which would be capturing technological progress that is creating uh, labor intensive tasks for workers. So these four different types of technological progress are labor augmenting technological change, that's an increase in AL or gamma LZ for all Z. We have automation at the extensive margin, that's that shift out to, to the right of the um, automation possibility frontier. Then we have uh, the deepening of automation uh, or automation at the intensive margin, that's an increase in AK or gamma KZ for all Z less than I. And then finally, an increase in N is the creation of new labor intensive tasks. And you can also graphically um, uh, show this, and it's probably good so that you remember um, what the different types of technological progress are. So labor augmenting technological progress, say in, captured by an increase in AL, is basically going to shift this entire um, unit cost curve down. And um, the, the shaded area here are what we will later call productivity effects. It's just capturing the fact that now you can produce each of these tasks cheaper than if you would use labor than before. So that's, that's labor augmenting technological progress graphically. Um, automation at the extensive margin, we said, is this shift out of this exogenous parameter I. And um, so you, know, you see again the shaded area is, is are the productivity gains or the efficiency gains that you um, have by now being able to produce the, these tasks using capital um, rather than labor um, and, and at, at lower unit costs. Um, so that's automation um, at the uh, extensive margin. You also have the deepening of automation, automation at the intensive margin, that's an increase in AK or the gamma K, um, and that's gonna be shifting this unit cost curve down. Uh, and again, the shaded area are just productivity effects that we'll return to later on. And then finally, the creation of new tasks is, is a shift out of this um, end parameter. Uh, so, you know, you basically, you extend the um, support of tasks um, towards more labor intensive tasks. What we'll also assume is that this type of technological progress will be combined with um, also a shift up of n minus one so that we keep the um, support of tasks on the unit interval. So whenever we shift up n, we're also going to be shifting up n minus one to make sure that we um, 
keep producing tasks on, on, on we keep using tasks from the unit interval. And um, this is um, making the model algebraically a lot more tractable, uh, but it's not qualitatively not essential to um, the, the insights of, of the, the intuition of um, the model. So what's then the equilibrium in this model? And before we derive the equilibrium, um, there is one condition or two conditions that we're going to assume that will always be satisfied in equilibrium. Uh, the first one is that um, the at, at this margin i, the cost of producing i using capital is always less than producing i using labor. So, and, and basically, you know, what this, what this means is that at i, the, the unit cost of producing um, I, so this, this ratio here is less than the unit cost of producing I using labor. So if I put Z equal to I here, um, then you know, this ratio has to be bigger than, than this ratio. The reason why we're gonna make that assumption is that because if we then later on assume that there's automation at the extensive margin, so this I shifts out that we are um, sure that these tasks here just to the right of i will be done by capital not labor and the uh, second reason is that um, even though that this type of technological progress is going to displace workers um, so that will reduce labor demand there's also going to be a, a productivity effect um, you know from the fact that i can now produce these tasks here more efficiently uh, that will push up labor demand. So I want output to go up um, if I if I shift I to the right, and um, output will only go up if, if there's some efficiency gains. And at the margin, uh, that that productivity effect will just be the red arrow. Um, you know, for a discrete change in I, it will be you know the entire difference between um, the area between these two uh, unit cost curves. The second condition is that um, that the when we have um, the creation of new labor-intensive tasks, so this this entire uh, window shifts to the right. So you have uh, this um, right side shifting to the right, but also this left side shifting to the right, assuming that we keep uh, tasks on the unit interval. Uh, what this blue arrow here um, imposes is as a condition is that the um, unit cost of uh, producing task and using labor. So this dotted line should be, should be here. Um, so this is the unit cost of producing and um, using labor, that that unit cost is less than the unit cost of producing N minus one uh, using capital. Such that, you know, if I, if I marginally shift out or increase N, then um, output is going to increase because there is an efficiency gain from losing um, the task here produced by capital and um, gaining the, the, the um, producing the task here and just to the right of n um, using labor. And again, you know th th that's to make sure that later on when we when we have an, an increase in um, in n as a form of technological progress. Then there's going to be this this not, not just an increase in labor demand because this is just um, increasing the demand for labor directly but there's also a further increase in labor demand because of a productivity effect uh, as output goes up because it's more efficient now to produce output um, given that that blue arrow so you can also formally um, express those those um, differences these the red arrow uh, and the blue arrow and you know that's very easy to see you just if you swap around here this uh, numerator with this denominator um, you immediately see that here you have r over this here that's the unit cost of producing i using capital here so you know the w over and then this denominator here is the unit cost of producing i uh, using labor and it has to be bigger than its unit than the unit cost of producing i using capital that's the red arrow and then the same for the blue arrow, the unit cost of producing um, N uh, using labor 
must be less than um, the unit cost of producing um, n minus one using capital. And uh, again, you know, the first inequality implies that all tasks below i will be produced by capital and that an increase in i increases y and a second inequality implies that an increase in n is also going to be increasing output. We're going to return to these equilibrium assumptions below because here I've written them as um, restrictions on you know, w over r cannot be um, too low nor too high. And um, later on, we're going to, once we've derived equilibrium expressions for w over r, we can rewrite these inequalities as functions of um, the um, exogenous parameters, namely k and l. Um, and that the capital labor ratio has to be um, between a lower bound and an upper bound for these equilibrium conditions to, to always hold. So for there always to be um, a red arrow and a blue arrow. Okay, so now turning to the equilibrium itself, um, the, remember that we assumed a um, Cobb-Douglas uh, production function that is combining a continuum of tasks to produce a final good Y. Uh, given that it's Cobb-Douglas, we also know that the expenditure shares are uh, not only constant but also equal. Um, and you know, given by PZ, YZ equal to Y, and that immediately gives you uh, the demand for task Z, YZ is equal to Y over PZ, where PZ is either the unit cost of producing Z using capital if Z is less than I, or the unit cost of producing Z uh, using labor if Z is bigger than I. And so what you can do is you can, you know, this expression for PZ can go here in the denominator. And then I also know that YZ is equal to um, this right-hand side here if Z is less than I. And um, I can you know, plug in my expression for YZ from the previous slide here. I can factor out KZ and um, that simplifies to KZ is equal to Y over R if Z is less than I. Uh, and is equal to zero if z is bigger than i. And so this gives you the demand for capital in each task z. You can do the same for labor. So you know that labor is um, used for the production of all tasks bigger than i, uh, and that task production is given by, by this um, linear uh, production function, um, or, you know, or this production function. And, um, that you know the previous slide also gives you an expression for yz that was you know y over pz where pz is now given by the unit cost of producing z using labor and that you know you can factor out lz uh, and that simplifies to lz is equal to um, zero for all tasks uh, less than i uh, but it's y over w for all tasks uh, above i and this gives the demand for labor uh, in each task z and so we can aggregate across um, KZ um, and we can aggregate across LZ using the um, market clearing conditions for um, capital was that all the KZs have to add up to K. Now, you know, that means that um, K has to be equal to Y over R um, and then the integral from N minus one to I because we know that for Z above I, there will not be any capital uh, demand to produce task Z. And then for all Z below um, I, we know that um, the demand for, for, so KZ is equal to Y over R. So basically K must be equal to this uh, simple expression, which uh, further simplifies to Y over R times, and then you have I minus um, N plus one. And the same for labor, you have that L must be equal to um, Y over W. And then we know that this is only going to be uh, the demand for tasks, or it's only going to be a uh, demand for labor to produce tasks above I. And so L simplifies to Y over W times N minus I. And you know, these two expressions give you, um, uh, allow you to back out or to factor out R and W. An expression for R is given by Y over K times I minus N plus one. And um, double and an expression for the wage is equal to Y over L um, times um, N minus I. And you can already see here that, you know, if you think of W um, as labor demand, 
that um, if you, for example, assume that there is automation, that's the, that's this the shift out of this um, automation possibility frontier, that that's going to be on the one hand lead to a direct displacement effect uh, captured by the second term here, uh, which is negative, so it's going to reduce labor demand. But at the same time, um, y over l, so average productivity is going to rise because of a positive productivity effect. Okay, so we had this um, expression for the equilibrium ra rate and um, the wage. Um, and so you can also, from, from these two expressions um, for the rental rate and the wage in equilibrium, you can also immediately derive an expression for the labor share because the labor share is just WL over Y. So the labor share must be equal to N minus I. And, you know, this is, this is um, new compared to our um, two-factor um, constant returns to scale world with factor, factor augmenting technologies where um, we said that if um, your um, production function is Cobb Douglas, then factor augmenting change will not affect the labor share. So, you know, in that Cobb Douglas world, um, so, so a two factor constant returns to scale Cobb Douglas uh, world, um, technological progress or factor augmenting technological change cannot affect the labor share. Here, we do have uh, types of technological progress, automation and the creation of new labor tasks that are going to be um, impacting on the labor share. And that is an important. Um, new insight uh, compared to um, the kind of the more traditional framework um, that we looked at before. So <laughs> we also know that um, in equilibrium, that the the price, which is the the the, uh, the price of the final good, has to be equal to marginal cost, where marginal cost for um, a Cobb Douglas technology on a continuum of uh, tasks is given by this expression here. And we said that the final good is chosen as a numeraire. So basically, you know, this expression here has to be equal to one. Now, what you can do is you can, you know what PZ is um, for the different tasks. For all tasks below I, you know that it's, it's going to be in logs um, you know, the log of R minus the log of, of this expression here. And for all tasks above I, uh, you know that they're going to be produced by uh, labor and the unit cost of producing PZ then is going to be in logs the log of W minus the log of um, AL gamma LZ. And um, I've taken logs here, so it has to be equal to zero. Now what I can do is I can use the equilibrium expressions that we just derived for R and W to, in the end, find an expression for aggregate output in equilibrium. So what I've done here is I've just um, substituted the expressions for R and um, I substituted um, the um, expressions for R and W in the equation that I just had before. Um, and so, you know, that basically that simplifies to, um, and you factor out the log of Y, uh, that simplifies to this um, expression here, where you know the first two uh, terms are related to the the um, comparative advantage schedules, and then the last two terms are related to um, the effective supply of capital, the effective supply of labor, and then um, the, the the exogenous parameters i and n. Now this is starting to look like something that. Um, is familiar in the sense that um, I can take the exponential of the, 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 the um, expression on the previous slide, which gives me y is equal to, and I'm introducing some new notation here, phi, which is going to be a function of i and n times, and then the effective supply of capital divided by one minus gamma, where gamma is also going to be a function of i and n to the power of one minus gamma times uh, the effective supply of labor divided by gamma to the power of gamma, where this, this phi is um, just the, you know, it's just the, the exponential of, of you know, these, two, this, these two terms here. Um, and where gamma is equal to um, n minus i. 
And of course, then one minus gamma is equal to I minus N plus one. And so uh, what you, and, and, and you know, we, we've made these parameters orange in the sense that they capture the task content of production so that they're um, functions of I and N that determine the, the allocation of capital and labor across task space. Uh, and that's different from the, the more traditional factor augmenting um, progress parameters, AK and AL, that we had um, in the more traditional uh, two-factor CRS environments. And of course, what you see here, equation three, is um, like, a, a, you know, it, it says that in the aggregate output is just um, a Cobb Douglas production function where, um, you know, so we're back into a um, two-factor um, CRS Cobb Douglas world with, with the factors of production of capital and labor, and there is scope for for um, um, for factor augmenting technological change. But what we also have added here is um, because our model is micro founded by um, the sorting of um, capital and labor across task space, we've added these orange terms here that will. Um, further allow for, for um, different types of technological progress, so changes in I or changes in N, that are going to affect the, um, the distribution parameter and also the, the labor share, the capital share, uh, as well as um, the um, um, Higgs neutral TFP growth. So, um, the, so the aggregate production function could be rewritten as a, um, so aggregate output in equilibrium, can be written as um, a Cobb Douglas um, production function for for two inputs, and um, you know in a way this is this is almost like magic where we started off with a um, a Cobb Douglas production function where the final good is produced using um, using a continuum of tasks, and what we've said now is that. If you derive equilibrium in the aggregate, this economy is also going to look uh, is, is going to look like a um, a two factor economy with capital and labor, um, where final output is produced, um, um, Cobb Douglas. But we have to be uh, we, we can be very precise, or we can be more precise about um, the, the the labor share and also the TFP parameter that are um, changing if there is. Um, technological progress at changing I or N, and so that's affecting the allocation of uh, capital and labor across task space. So in very general terms, what you can see is we've, we've augmented the, the traditional two-factor uh, framework. Um, you know, that before that was just Y is equal to F and then K and L, where we had, we, we did account for uh, factor augmenting technological changes. And then we've now added to this, this orange terms um, because we have here an aggregate production function that's micro-founded by um, these task-based um, models, or a task-based model. Um, okay, so what we've done, so we've derived an aggregate production function where differential technological change works through different channels. In particular, what's new here is that technological progress can also change the distribution parameter and um, the Higgs neutral TFP term. And task models provide micro foundations for changes in the distribution parameter and TFP due to technological progress. And in particular, so where these, these orange terms, uh, so the, this, this phi and the gamma um, depend on is, is the, the allocation of, um, or the reallocation of uh, capital and labor across task space when there is automation or when there is, um, when technology is creating new labor intensive tasks. And you know, basically, the the um, the, the um, okay. So um, finally, what we're also going to assume. So I'm, I said that I would come back to uh, these uh, equilibrium conditions that that uh, or conditions that we assume are always true in equilibrium. That's the existence of this this red arrow um, at i, and then the existence of the blue arrow. Um, at n relative to n minus one, and we've said that you know what we assume is that 
know, this must be true in equilibrium. The red arrow is the first inequality, the blue arrow is the second inequality, where we said that the, the relative factor prices have to be above a lower bound, below an upper bound. And you can, given that we now have expression, an expression for W over R in equilibrium, uh, that depends on um, the capital labor ratio and then also the exogenous parameters I and N, you can basically rewrite this set of inequalities um, as uh, a restriction on the capital labor ratio that cannot be too low or um, cannot be too high. And you know the intuition is uh, very simple. If I go back one slide here, so for, for the red arrow to exist, you must have that the capital labor ratio must be sufficiently high because imagine that the capital labor ratio is very low. So K over L is very low, which means that capital is relatively scarce. That's going to push up R relative to W. And, you know, if, and that's going to make the, the, the red arrow smaller and smaller. And it could be that K over L becomes so low um, that this unit cost line is, is, is going above the uh, unit cost line for um, uh, labor. So the capital labor ratio must be sufficiently um, high, but at the same time, for the blue arrow to exist, the capital labor ratio cannot be too high, so must be below an upper bound. Because imagine that the capital labor ratio is very high, then it means that you know, capital is relatively abundant, and so R is going to be low relative to W, and so you know, that's going to be narrowing the, the blue arrow. Uh, and so if the capital labor ratio gets too high, then um, that blue arrow is going to become um, wrongly signed. Okay, so that's the intuition here. Um, now, interesting, of course, is what do these different types of technological progress, what's the impact, um, what's their impact on labor demand and the labor share? And I'm going to focus on um, three types of technological progress. So I'm not going to talk about labor augmenting technological change anymore. Um, I'm just going to focus on automation at the extensive margin, the deepening of automation, and the creation of new labor-intensive tasks. And we'll argue that these different types of technological change have, di have different effects on uh, labor demand and the labor share. So let's first start with automation. So we said that automation is just this shift out to the right uh, of this exogenous parameter i. And you know that's going to have a direct displacement effect that's going to reduce labor demand. So because you know these these tasks just to the right of I will be produced with capital, not labor. Uh, labor is going to be displaced because of automation. That's a direct displacement effect uh, that is reducing labor demand. But and you know there is there is you know the question is so, so you can say well what is this this I I this exogenous um, threshold I this automation possibility frontier. And you know why do we think that it, it shifts to the right? And you know there is at least anecdotal um, evidence um, from from um, the recent, but also the the um, uh, more ancient past um, that suggests that this way of capturing technological progress is um, is accurate. So you know, tasks and automation have been at the center of technological change throughout the last 200 years. So for example, go back to um, the uh, 19th uh, century, early 19th century, there was you know, the introduction of um, horsepower threshing machines replacing manual labor. Then later on, the machine tools uh, replaced um, labor intensive artisan techniques. That's for example, the Luddite movement, which were, you know, artisans that were uh, revolting against the automation of their, um, of their um, you know, labor, relatively labor intensive tasks. And then, you know, more recently, since um, in, in the early to mid um, and up to today, uh, 20th century, uh, industrial robots automating assembly lines, think for example, about the automation of car assembly. Uh, and then since uh, the 1980s, uh, software automated um, tasks by uh, so the tasks done by office clerks. So there's clearly there's you know at least anecdotal evidence that supports this idea of gives some intuition to this shift to the right 
of I or this automation at the extensive margin and workers being directly displaced by these types of automation. And that would reduce their labor demand, would directly reduce their wages and their wage levels. Um, of course, what there's also um, at work, once we shift this, this um, threshold to the right, are these productivity effects. And for um, an infinitesimal change in I, it's just going to be you know, this, this red arrow, basically, um, that we had before. So, um, so it's just going to be this red arrow that we had before. Um, and you know, for a discrete change, the productivity effect is just going to be this entire shaded area. Uh, but but the, the, the intuition is the same that as, as we expand um, the tasks that can be done by capital, given that they can be produced cheaper uh, by capital, we um, and output is going to increase, and that's going to be increasing the demand for all factors of production, so also labor. So that's just a, you know, a traditional scale effect uh, in labor demand. And so basically, um, you, know, you can also express that uh, a bit more algebraically rather than graphically. We had these two expressions for the rental rate of capital and the wage in equilibrium. You can take the second one, take the log, and then you differentiate with respect to i. That gives you the, the, the change in the log of n minus i, that's just this last term here, with respect to i plus the change in y over L with respect to I, uh, the change in the log of y over L with respect to I. And this first term here, that's the, the displacement effect. Um, that's just gonna be uh, minus one over N minus I. So that's capturing that um, if I increases, that directly um, reduces um, the wage because workers are displaced by uh, capital. So the displacement effect is negative. But at the same time, um, productivity goes up. That's the productivity effect. Uh, that's uh, positive. That's you know, the, the red arrow um, or, you know, uh, that I've just shown you graphically. Now, of course, what you uh, should be able to, to do is to um, go back to the uh, expression for output or log of output um, and derive that with respect to I you, you would need to get that expression for um, the red arrow, which is exactly what, um, what you get. So if you take the expression that we had before for the log y, and you uh, derive that with respect to i, uh, you get um, the, um, at least in log terms, the difference in um, the unit cost of producing i using labor relative um, to using uh, I, to producing I, um, one unit of I using uh, capital. And uh, just to show you uh, how, how you can you know, get to this expression, so how you can use equations three to five to derive that productivity effect um, algebraically rather than just graphically, um, I'll show you that um, explicitly. So, the productivity effect from automation is given by the change in the log of y over L uh, for a change in I. And so, you know, because L is just given inelastically, so that's just a given number that's not gonna change. Uh, that's equal to the change in the log of y over I. And we had an expression for the log of y um, that we derived from, you know, assuming price must equal marginal costs and then substituting expressions for prices and using the expressions for R and W in equilibrium and then factoring out the log of Y. We found this expression here that you can write as A plus B. So this, this first, some of these first two terms we call A and then the, this last two terms we call B. And what I'm interested in of course is of how each of these two terms depend on I. So I'm gonna derive A with respect to I and also B with respect to I. And if I derive A with respect to I, you see I pops up here as an upper bound in the, on, on the first integral and a lower bound on the second integral. So that just gives me um, this expression here. And then B derived with respect to I, um, you see I pops up here and here but also here and here. Um, so I get um, these four terms here 
um, which simplify to this expression here. And then um, using that, um, so if we write this here, I can use again the expressions for R and W to um, find this very simple expression for the, the change, so D, uh, DB for uh, DI. And um, what I then have to do is I have to sum these two up. Um, so, you know, the, the, how A is going to change for a change in I plus how B is going to change for a change in I. I sum these two up, I rewrite them, and I find um, in logs the difference between producing I using labor relative to um, producing I using uh, capital. And, you know, we said that as long as there is a red arrow, uh, that difference must be positive. So that's how you, you derive the productivity effect. Um, so this productivity effect. Um, and that means that the, the total effect on labor demand from automation is going to be the, the, the displacement effect, which was just minus 1 over n minus i, negative, plus and then the productivity effect, where we've now um, made the productivity effect more explicitly. And we could have immediately look, got it immediately from the graph. I've also shown you how, you how to derive it more formally. Now, what this means is that, you know, the impact of automation on labor demand is ambiguous. So on the one hand, you have um, a direct displacement effect that tends to reduce labor demand. Uh, on the other hand, there is a productivity effect. And a priori, it's ambiguous which one is of these two is going to dominate. But you can think of, say, um, Imagine that the, the unit costs of producing I uh, with labor are very similar to the unit costs of producing I with capital, which means that these two terms are very close to each other, which means that this difference will be, it will be positive, but it will be very small, so that it's more likely that the displacement effect dominates um, and automation leads to a fall in, in wage levels for, for, um, for, for workers. And so, you know, whenever that's the case, as Simoglu and Estripo talk about what they call so-so so -so technologies. So-so technologies are technologies where, um, you know, for, for um, infinitesimal changes where this red arrow is very small or for discrete changes where the shaded area is very small. So these are technologies that automate the tasks that workers do, but have very low, um, um, impact on productivity. So, you know, technologies that can um, easily automate what workers do, but don't necessarily increase um, productivity um, by much. If that's the case, then um, automation will, will reduce, in net will reduce labor demand, will reduce the wage. So before I move on to the impact of automation on the labor share, uh, one final um, side note is that uh, in the long run, so we talked about the, the productivity effect increasing the demand for labor um, in the short run. In the long run, you can think of additional reasons why uh, labor demand would, would increase um, if um, the, the rent rate of capital is, is constant. So we had these two expressions for R and W, and we said that um, an increase in, in I uh, and also you know, an increase in Y because of the productivity effect, uh, that's going to, um, to increase R. So we said that you know, the, the impact is, is on, on the wage is ambiguous. If I goes up, there is a displacement effect. If Y goes up, um, there's a, and, but also Y goes up, so there's a productivity effect. Um, you, you could think of you know, the, the increase, the impact of automation on uh, the demand for um, um, capital has, you know, so I goes up, uh, which means that, you know, the, the, the lower bound, sorry, the, the, um, the I threshold shifts to the right. That's like a, an expansion effect for capital. Um, and at the same time, there's a productivity effect. And so, you know, in the short run, you would expect the um, uh, rental rate of capital to increase. Now, we know that, you know, in the long run, um, okay, you we could assume that the rental rate of capital is constant. So because, um, you know, in, in the short run, this increase in R um, is going to lead to capital accumulation in the long run. 
such that as K increases, R returns to um, its, its long run um, uh, steady state level. Now, you know, if K increases, then remember that in the aggregate, we're just back into this, this um, two factor CRS uh, world where there's Q complementarity. So an increase in, in K is also going to be increasing uh, wages in the long run. So an additional force for an increase in labor demand in, in the long run uh, is this process of capital accumulation uh, if the uh, rental rate of capital is constant in, in the steady state. But just a side note, um, but that could be an additional reason why in the long run this, the displacement effect is less likely to dominate because in the long run we not only have a productivity effect uh, but also um, Q complementarity working, uh, increasing labor demand because there's capital accumulation in the economy. So uh, turning to the impact of automation on the labor share, we had that the labor share was given by N minus I, and you can differentiate um, the labor share with respect to I, so that's just minus one and that's negative. So automation reduces uh, the labor share. Another way of seeing that is, if you look at the, the you can write the, the change in the log of the labor share as the change in the log of the wage minus the change in the log of y over l for changes in i. And um, so we, we know, um, you know what, what this is. This is just a productivity effect, which is positive. Uh, we also know that the change in the log of the wage for a change in i is the sum of a productivity effect and a displacement effect. So basically, the uh, change in the log of the labor share is um, given by the displacement effect, which we know is negative. And, and said differently, what, why the labor share decreases is because automation is increasing productivity more than the wage. OK. so. In sum, automation has an ambiguous effect on labor demand because of a negative displacement effect and a positive productivity effect. When technologies are so-so, automation will decrease labor demand because the displacement effect dominates the productivity effect, at least in the short run. And automation will always reduce the labor share because it increases productivity of more than the wage. Okay, so the second type of technological progress, uh, deepening of automation or automation at the intensive margin. Uh, graphically, that's just this shift down of the uh, unit cost, um, unit costs of producing tasks below I with capital because AK increases or gamma KZ increases. And um, that's going to increase uh, labor demand. And you, know, the, you could think of it as just a, a Q complementarity in this, um, uh, in the aggregate two factor Cobb Douglas world. So, because we had that, we could write output, aggregate, output in equilibrium as uh, this equation here. And you assume now, say, an increase in AK, uh, we get that labor demand must increase. Uh, we have that. So we had that the wage, so the wage was given by y over l times n minus i. So uh, if I take logs, then the change in the log of the wage, and now I'm keeping n and i constant, so it must be equal to the change in the log of y over l. And from equation three here, I can see what, um, uh, how the log of y over l depends on um, the log of a k. Uh, and so I can just write the change in the log of y over l as um, i minus n plus 1 times the change in the log of a k. And that must be positive, assuming that a k increases. And you know, this term in, in, in brackets is positive. And what's really at work here, that's just a Q complementarity in this, this aggregate um, two factor world with constant returns to scale. Also, note that. Factor augmenting changes have no impact. Um, so, so um, capital augmenting technological progress has no impact uh, on the labor share. 
because wages and productivity per worker or productivity are um, increasing proportionately. The next type of technological progress is the creation of new labor intensive tasks. And that's just a shift out of N. And uh, by assumption, we're also going to be shifting N minus one up. Uh, so we keep tasks produced on a unit interval. And what this is going to do for labor is that we're going to have here an increase in labor demand because of a reinstatement effect. But at the same time, as long as we have a blue arrow, there's also going to be a productivity effect. So we can also express that more formally. So we had, going back again to the expressions for the rental rate of capital and wages in equilibrium, you can take this second one, take logs derived with respect to N, so no longer I, that's automation. We're now looking at an increase in N, the creation of new labor intensive tasks. And you see that, you know, that's gonna be um, equal to um, one over N minus I, and then plus um, the uh, increase in um, the log of Y over L because N increases. And this first term here, that's just a reinstatement effect. And then the second term is a productivity effect which again is going to be graphically the blue arrow. So that's the, the in logs, the difference in um, unit costs of uh, producing N minus one with capital versus producing um, N with labor. Or you can also go back to the expression of log of Y uh, as I did on the blackboard and now derive with respect to N instead of I and so that gives you this productivity effect, which must be positive. And so the creation of new labor intensive tasks is going to increase labor demand because you have both a reinstatement and a productivity effect uh, pushing in the same direction. The impact of the creation of new labor intensive tasks on the labor share, um, given that the labor share you know, in this, this simple cop douglas world is just N minus I, uh, the impact, of course, is going to be positive. The labor share is going to go up if there's the creation of new labor intensive tasks. Another way of uh, writing that or seeing that is to look at the change in the log of the labor share, which is just the change in the log of the wage minus the change in the log of Y over L for changes in N. We know that this here is the productivity effect, uh, which is positive. And we also know that the, the wage uh, the change in the log wage is the combination of a productivity effect and a reinstatement effect. So such that the change in the log wage is just given by this reinstatement effect, which must be positive. Which is basically saying that the labor share increases uh, because um, the creation of new labor intensive tasks is increasing the wage more than, than um, productivity because of the existence of um, a reinstatement effect. Now, we said that the labor share is now affected by technological progress through either a change in N or a change in I. Um, and in this very simple world, uh, both N and I have an equal impact on the labor share. So um, automation is gonna decrease the labor share despite the productivity effects. Uh, there is a stronger displacement effect that is gonna be pushing the labor share down whereas the creation of new labor intensive tasks is going to increase the labor share. And so if you have a constant labor share that suggests that both forces are balancing each other out. So you, in the economy, you have both automation, um, but equally strong creation of new labor intensive tasks. It, more recently, a falling labor share would suggest that um, automation is still going strong, whereas um, the end, the creation of new labor intensive tasks is um, falling behind, thereby reducing the labor share uh, in the economy. So, directed technical change and balanced growth. So, a full task model would endogenize uh, capital accumulation and the direction of research towards either automation, uh, DI, or the creation of new tasks. So, you know, when you could think of um, an alternative framework where uh, capital is no longer supplied inelastically, but is produced by, say, some intermediate sector. And that sector is going to have to decide whether to invest or develop 
um, you know, the, invest in the I or in the N. And what Asimoglu and Restrepo show in, in their AER paper, um, when they look at the uh, dynamic equilibrium, they show that the, there can exist a stable balanced growth path in which the I and the N go hand in hand, where stability results from the fact that the I is reducing the wage uh, and that's going to discourage further the I but encourage the N. Um, and vice versa, you know, if, if you, know, you would then switch from you know, less the I to more the N, we know that that's going to increase labor demand, that's going to increase the wage, which um, in itself is going to reduce incentives to further do the I, and it's going to increase incentives to further do the N, and it's going to increase incentives to um, switch to the I, um, so that the wage falls again, and um, uh, as you switch towards more intensive the I relative to the N. And so you can think of, of uh, incentives in that intermediate sector, um, such that you know the I and the N are keeping each other um, in check, and such that you know the labor the labor share stays constant at least before uh, 2000, uh, but not afterwards. So that would be an environment, an extended environment, where you uh, endogenize the amount of capital in the economy um, produced by an intermediate sector that that um, is incentivized to either um, produce DI or, or in, you know, develop the N um, based on uh, factor prices in the economy. So that's directed technological change. And there's, there is, you know, it's possible that um, there is balanced growth um, between the I and the N uh, such that the labor share is constant and which is what we saw for, for um, most of the um, uh, years um, after the Industrial Revolution, but not more recently, so after 2000. A final note is, um, so we've talked about the I and we've talked about the N, and I've, I've given you, when we talked about the I, I've given you some intuition as to, you know, what would be, um, you know, can you give us some examples for this shift out in, in uh, the uh, automation possibility frontier? And I gave you some examples, like more recently, there is the, the automation of um, car assembly lines, you know, robots doing all the car assembly these days, uh, rather than, than um, car assembly line workers, uh, or um, office clerks being automated by um, ICT uh, technologies. Now, what about uh, new labor intensive tasks, so the DN? And here, I think we have Today we have much less of a good idea. You know what, what is uh, what these new labor-intensive tasks are um, that technology is is creating, and so the creation of new tasks in which labor has a comparative advantage has a positive effect on labor demand and the labor share. And uh, so task changes for which labor has a comparative advantage. Um, actually include two things. So one is, you know, more complex versions of existing labor tasks, uh, as well as the creation of new labor intensive tasks. And, you know, we don't really have a very clear idea of um, what these new labor intensive tasks are, uh, or what is what is um, how they how they come about. And that's why sometimes um, these new labor intensive tasks are called the dark matter of task-based models, um, where you know dark matter refers to uh, something. It, it's a force that's potentially very strong, uh, but um, unknown. And especially, you know, when you think about the recent fall in the labor share, if you do think that that's to um, to some extent driven by technological progress, you would have to find reasons why. Um, the end, so the creation of new labor intensive tasks has, um, has decelerated relative to um, automation. Final uh, subsection in this section is um, turning to the policy debate and kind of you know, taking a step back from the model that we've developed 
in um, the previous subsections. And so often when you uh, participate in a policy debate, the, there is this false dichotomy that um, either people argue that uh, technology is, has, has disastrous effects for workers. So um, robots will steal all our jobs or 55% you know, of all jobs will be automated by 2030. Um, or you, know, you have people who say that technology is, is, um, only has benign effects. I think what this framework shows you is that it's, you know, it's, it's much more nuanced. So on the one hand, it underscores that automation will uh, always create a displacement effect. And I think that's an important insight that you know, technology can have, um, can displace workers and can have, can reduce the, the wages and levels um, of these workers. Um, but it can also be neutralized. So there's, you know, besides next to this displacement effect, there's also countervailing forces that are um, productivity effects from automation. So at the intensive margin, uh, at the extensive margin, but there's also um, the Q complementarity from um, automation at the extensive margin. And then of course, you know, there is um, the creation of new labor intensive tasks. And, you know, it's, it's that, it's that interplay um, between these different forces that in the end will determine what happens to, to labor demand. And when you look at the labor share, I think there the discussion is that the automation is going to, um, and the displacement effect uh, is going to reduce the labor share, so rise inequality in the economy, um, unless it is counterbalanced by uh, in, in technology increasing um, the number of new labor intensive tasks. So technology also creating, creating good jobs um, that um, support wages and therefore uh, the labor share. Section 8.5 flies in the ointment. What we will be doing in this section is to add inefficiencies to the baseline model to see how they affect the impact of automation uh, on outcomes. So in the baseline model, the reallocation of capital and labor across tasks due to automation or the creation of new labor intensive tasks is frictionless. And therefore the baseline model underplays the importance of adjustment costs and inefficiencies. And so what we'll do in this section is we'll focus on the impact of automation on um, a number of outcomes, but mainly um, the impact of automation on um, output, assuming uh, three inefficiencies uh, we could also look at, uh, instead of looking at automation, we could also look at the uh, impact of the creation of new labor intensive tasks, assuming um, the same, but probably uh, more interesting, um, assuming other types of inefficiencies. The inefficiencies that we're going to be focusing on uh, now are going to be one technology scale mismatch, two uh, bias taxes that subsidize capital relative to labor, and three labor market imperfections that result in uh, wage rents for workers uh, whose jobs uh, are going to be automated. And what these inefficiencies have in common is that they all result in the misallocation of factors in equilibrium, and in particular, uh, the fact that the demand for capital relative to labor is too high. And we'll show that these ineff inefficiencies are gonna be mitigating the positive impact of um, uh, automation on um, output. So the first inefficiency, the mismatch of technologies and skills, let's tweak the baseline model uh, by assuming that there's now two types of um, workers. There are L low skilled workers and their H high skilled workers. And uh, importantly, the low skilled workers can only do uh, the tasks between I, the um, automation possibility frontier, and then some threshold which is, which is exo exogenous S, somewhere between I and N. And lower S means that there's more of a skill mismatch. It's just saying that the tasks that these low skilled workers can do, um, the range of tasks that they can do is, is smaller, the lower is S. So um, the less mobile these low skilled workers are across task space. So um, the more skill uh, mismatch, technology skill mismatch there is. 
Uh, let's also assume that um, the productivity of low and high skilled workers is the same. We could assume differential productivities, but the more restrictive assumption is going to be uh, this S here. Um, and then finally, also assume that uh, the wage of high skilled workers is bigger than, always bigger than the wage of uh, low skilled workers in equilibrium. And you, know, you could get that by, for example, assuming that H is sufficiently low relative to L um, to make sure that this is always true. Following the same steps as in the baseline model, we then have the same expression for the random rate of capital, but now we have two wages, the wage for skilled and unskilled workers, um, you know, which have the familiar form. So the wage of um, high skilled workers is y, y over H, the supply times, and then their task range. So uh, high skilled workers are gonna be doing uh, tasks um, from S upwards to N. And low skilled workers, um, WL, their wage is given by Y over L times S minus I, where again, IS is their task range. So low skilled workers are gonna be doing uh, all tasks above I uh, and up to S because tasks above S, uh, we assume that they can just not do that. They don't have mobility to go into um, that uh, part of task space. So one thing you can already do is to um, divide WH by WL, take the logs and differentiate with respect to I, gives you one over S minus I, uh, that's gonna be positive. And it's positive because, you know, as automation is, is shifting the automation possibility frontier to the right, um, then WL is going to fall because these, these low skilled workers are squeezed in an even smaller range of tasks that they can do. Um, and so relative to, to WL, they're, they're, um, so WL relative to WH is going to fall or WH relative to WL is going to increase and wage inequality rises if, when there's automation. What you also see is that um, that increase is going to be larger if S is smaller. So if there's more technology skill mismatch, then inequality is going to go up by more uh, for that same shift out in the um, automation possibility frontier. And you know, that's, that's in a way also very intuitive because the, the smaller S is, the, the more these low skilled workers are squeezed into a smaller set range of tasks. Um, and so um, that will amplify the, the impact of automation um, on wage inequality. That was looking at the um, impact of automation on, on wage inequality. Um, when there is technology skill mismatch, but I said that my main focus here is going to be on another outcome, which is uh, productivity or output. And um, we know from the baseline model that the productivity effects of the change in the log of y over l with respect to i is given by um, the, the difference in logs of the unit cost of producing I using uh, now low skilled workers um, relative to um, again logs the unit cost of producing I using capital and we said that that must always be positive so graphically that was this this red arrow that I've shown you on um, the figures above and what you also have from the previous slide is an expression for WL over R. So WL over R is just given by this right hand side here. And what this is saying is that if S is smaller, then WL over WR is gonna be smaller. And the intuition is again the same that as S is smaller, that kind of, or S minus I is smaller, that's, that's reducing the task range that these L type workers can do. Um, and you know, you more, the more you squeeze their task uh, range, the lower their wage will be. And so if S is small, then WL over WR is gonna be small. And then this productivity effect from automation is gonna be small. And so basically this is saying that, you know, we, the presence of S is basically gonna be reducing uh, the wage of these low skilled workers. And that's going to make the, the red arrow or the productivity effect um, smaller. So what are the policy implications of this? So whenever there is technology skill mismatch, so whenever you have a, a, a limited mobility of workers that are in jobs um, that can be automated, so S 
it's less than N. Uh, that results in a misallocation uh, because unskilled workers do, do, do uh, too few tasks given their limited task mobility. And so, you know, if DI is automating the tasks of workers with limited mobility, uh, then the productivity gains from automation are going to be lower, as we've shown on the previous slide. And so, you know, what that implies is that you can think of, of policies that are increasing as if, if we can increase S, then we can um, increase the productivity gains from automation. And that could be done by uh, investing in education, training, or also active labor market policies targeted to displaced workers that increase their mobility to uh, more labor intensive tasks. And um, an example of that is that productivity growth from automation in the early 20th century. Uh, there was a lot of automation in the early 20th century, but there was also still a relatively high productivity growth. Um, and we think that that high productivity growth um, resulting from automation was supported by the high school movement that was um, kind of making sure that S was high enough uh, by investing a lot in um, um, education. The second inefficiency is uh, bias taxes that subsidize capital relative to labor. And so let's think of a different environment now where capital is no longer uh, inelastically supplied, it's no longer fixed, uh, but produced as an, an intermediate good. So there's an intermediate sector now um, that is uh, producing capital at a fixed cost R, but importantly, it's also using the final good as an input. So it, it, it requires resources uh, to produce capital. In the final good sector, um, the use of capital is going to receive a subsidy tau, uh, such that the rental rate of capital in the production of final goods is going to be one minus tau times R. And you can think of this tau as either a direct um, tax credit for investments, or you can also think of it as a tax code that is um, biased to, towards in favor of capital um, and uh, relative to labor against labor. And what we're going to have in this model is that there's going to be uh, too much capital produced by the intermediate sector, which requires resources. And uh, this will mitigate the impact of automation on uh, what we will define on the next slide as GDP which is um, the value added um, of the um, final goods sector. That's you know, output of the final goods sector minus um, the um, intermediate inputs uh, produced by the um, intermediate sector producing capital at cost R. So define GDP as value added output. Uh, so Y minus RK then you know with y the value of final goods produced and rk the costs of producing capital then what you can do is you can totally differentiate um, or decompose the change in gdp because of automation into um, three components so the first component is the change in um, final good output uh, because of automation but keeping capital constant which is what we did in the baseline model. But then, you know, we also have to account for the fact that there's capital accumulation in the economy. So K isn't fixed. Um, and so capital accumulation because of automation is gonna contribute to GDP um, by the second term. But then note that um, if there's capital accumulation uh, because of automation, um, the intermediate goods sector has to produce that capital, and that's going to be um, requiring uh, resources um, that are going to be uh, netted out of um, GDP. And so the first term gives the impact of automation on uh, final goods output, keeping capital constant as in the baseline model. And then these two last terms account for the, the impact of automation on capital accumulation in the economy, its impact on final goods production, um, but also its impact on the intermediate sector. And um, the fact that um, we're focusing here on GDP, um, so value added, uh, not Y. 
And so the change in value added to GDP um, due to automation was given by this decomposition here. And I've said that we, we know what this, this first term is. That's just the productivity effect from the baseline model. And um, you know, with a small difference that you know, the productivity effect from the baseline model was the change in the log of Y um, when there was automation. But we knew that uh, the change in the log of Y because there was automation was given by um, this difference uh, in um, the logs of uh, the unit cost of producing I using labor or the unit cost of producing I using capital. Where now you know, I'm looking here at final goods production. So the price of capital is subsidized. It's one minus tau times R, not R. And um, I, I multiply through by Y because um, I'm, I, I need dy over y, not uh, d log y over y. And so this is a productivity effect. Um, or, you know, it's said differently. This is again the, the, the red arrow and, um, and on the figures above. And you see that now we've actually created more, a bigger red arrow uh, because of the um, um, tax subsidy. So we're gonna um, have, uh, the tax subsidy resulting in, in um, a bigger productivity effect. But importantly, um, we also have these, these final two terms here and you can you know, bring them together. Uh, and that leaves you just with minus tau times R um, times the change in the capital stock because of automation. And so what this is capturing is that um, as, as there's capital uh, accumulation, uh, the intermediate sector is going to require resources um, and um, that's so said differently it's costly for for the economy to uh, accumulate capital and so that's an excessive automation effect uh, and because the um, capital accumulates as there's automation this whole term is going to be negative and so that's going to be um, a drag on uh, the change in value added gdp Okay, so um, two side notes. The first one is, I said that you can think of tau in either of two ways. The first way is to think of tau just as a tax um, credit for debt financed uh, investments in capital. So a direct subsidy to, to um, uh, using capital, or you can think of um, tau as a bias in the tax code in favor of capital and uh, against labor. Now, if you take this, an argument of a biased tax code, you could also say, well, let's set tau equal to zero here and let's add a one plus t, uh, where t is, is some, some positive tax um, uh, rate on, on labor uh, in front of the w. Um, that is gonna change how you formally analyze that, that um, bias in a tax code, but the intuition is gonna be exactly the same in that you, you're still gonna have too much capital accumulation in the economy, uh, which can be costly. Which, um, and th that's the first comment. The second comment is that, um, you know, can we think of an example, an intuitive example that, that illustrates um, this inefficiency? And perhaps too intuitive, but, you know, um, showing the, the importance of, of the inefficiency is think of an economy where you have a number of final goods producers and they're now subsidized, say, you know, think of town now as a direct um, tax uh, um, credit for, for investments in capital. Um, so town goes up. Now all these firms are started are, are innovating, you know, perhaps they're, they're investing in say uh, cloud applications. And imagine that, you know, the demand for uh, cloud applications rises to the extent that there now has to be a data center built. And a data center is requiring resources, mainly power, and let's assume that that is pushing up electricity prices also for these farmer goods producers. That's how you know the capital accumulation can be a drag on um, the, the value added that is produced by these farmer goods firms. Okay, so in terms of policy implications, so automation increases productivity, but taxes that subsidize capital relative to labor could lower this productivity gain. 
And the reason is that tax codes that subsidize capital relative to labor uh, result in capital accumulation that uh, could be costly. And so, you know, it is true that in most advanced economies, current tax codes um, favor capital income and capital investments over payroll taxes. And so this tilted playing field um, can lead to what Asimoglu and Estropo call socially excessive automation if the productivity gains um, from automation are outweighed by um, this, this, the costs of capital accumulation. So if I go back one slide, you know, given that this first term is positive, the second term is negative, it could be that um, the, um, the second term is in absolute terms bigger than the first term. And if that would be the case, then the social planner um, would want to reduce rather than increase um, automation. So as, as long as this, you know, there is a drag from, from automation, um, as long as that drag is, is in absolute value smaller than the productivity gain, uh, GDP is going to increase when there's automation and the social planner can always then redistribute um, the gains from automation uh, in the economy. But, you know, when this last term in absolute value is bigger than this first term, um, then the social planner is going to want to reduce automation, um, not increase it. Or reduce I, not, not um, increase it. Okay, so the final inefficiency are labor market imperfections with wage rents for workers in um, jobs that will be automated. So <clears throat> let's assume that um, there are LA workers um, employed in, in tasks for I up to um, a task threshold J, where J is some, some exogenous task, task threshold between I and N, where workers earn a, a wage rent omega uh, such, such that the wages in, um, for workers doing tasks I to J is uh, 1 plus omega W compared to uh, workers in tasks um, or employed in tasks uh, above J who just earned the wage W. And so importantly here is the exogenous parameter is J. So I'm going to just assume that there is some task threshold J and um, all employment in, um, um, in tasks I to J uh, is going to be perhaps in a sector um, that is earning this wage rent 1 plus omega W, w and um, all tasks produced by workers above um, J is going to be um, in jobs that are not earning the same omega wage rent, they're just earning the wage W. And the LA is, is, um, is an endogenous outcome. So L is still fixed. We assume that labor is supplied inelastically, but how many workers are gonna be employed um, in this sector where you earn wage rent, that's gonna be um, an endogenous outcome. So this is different from the first case where we said that, um, so the, the um, technology skill mismatch, where we said that um, you know, workers can, can uh, so between I and some upper threshold S, um, these were the unskilled workers and the only task they could do was in that segment. Here, um, I'm, I'm um, still allowing workers to do, to do any tasks, uh, but now I'm assuming that there is this, this sector, say, um, producing tasks I to J, where uh, workers can earn wage rents. So, and you can think of this omega, these wage rents as uh, unionized jobs or, or sectors. Um, uh, you can think of it as efficiency wages or any labor market uh, friction. The only restriction here is that we, we have to be on the labor demand curve. So, you know, uh, monopsony um, is, is, uh, is not gonna work, for example. And what we will see, what we'll get is that these wage rents imply that um, the, the number of workers that are going to be allocated to uh, the sector where wage rents are earned, so LA, will be too low relative to um, the employment in, in the other jobs, in the non-wage rent jobs, from a social point of view. And so automation of tasks done by these um, workers earning wage rents will, is going to worsen this misallocation. And you can see that quite easily 
so we have so you can get derive expressions for um, la just following the same steps as in the baseline model uh, that's going to be uh, y over one plus omega times w and then the task range that these um, la workers are, are, are going to be uh, producing and then the demand for um, the workers that are employed in in the other sectors where where no wage rents are present uh, it's just going to be y over w and then that these are going to be workers producing tasks uh, from j all the way up to n and so relative demand for uh, la relative to um, l minus la is just going to be this expression here that's just this divided by this and um, you see that um, relative demand for for LA um, is uh, decreasing in omega and increasing in I. And you see that, you know, it's, it's decreasing in omega and that's just capturing that as, as omega uh, increases. Um, you, know, you need these jobs to be more efficient and so you're going to be reducing, um, you're going to be running up along the labor demand curve, uh, reducing employment. Uh, and um, an, an increase in I that's here um, is also going to be is going to be um, a decreasing the relative demand for for LA because you know that's just shifting out the automation possibility frontier um, and so um, that's just decreasing the the demand for for LA uh, relative to um, the other jobs. And so I'm going to be focusing again on a change in, in output um, due to automation. And I can again decompose that into uh, three terms. The first one is the change in output when there's automation uh, keeping LA constant plus, and then I have um, the, the change in uh, output that is accounting for uh, the change in, in the reallocation of workers uh, across sectors. Um, because there's automation. Um, and that's captured by these two terms here. So now as LA is going to be uh, changing, also L minus LA is going to be changing. So automation is going to be also uh, reallocating uh, these um, or result in a reallocation of workers um, across the two sectors, the wage rent sector and the other sector. And that's captured by these last two terms here. But the first term is still, um, you know, the same productivity effect as we had before, uh, given that at the automation um, possibility frontier, uh, the workers employed there are um, these, these LA workers in, in sectors earning wage rents. And so again, the, the productivity effect is, is this, this red arrow um, that's going to be given by <clears throat> in um, the log difference of um, the unit cost of producing I using uh, labor, but now the, the cost of workers is, is one plus omega times W uh, versus um, or the unit cost of uh, producing I using capital. And because I have the log differences here, I'm, pre -mul I'm, I'm multiplying through by, uh, by I because I'm looking here at the change in I, not the, uh, the change in log of I. So that's this first term here, that's just as in the baseline model. And then I can combine these two last terms here, um, knowing that, that L is just given. So total labor supply is still um, inelastic. Um, and so that simplifies to uh, this term here, omega W, and then the, the, the reallocation of, of LA um, when there's automation. And uh, this whole term here is going to be uh, negative because as, as um, I increases, I'm going to be reducing LA. So I'm going to be reallocating workers from the, the um, sector that's earning wage rents to um, other, other jobs where workers don't, or don't earn those wage rents. And so, you know, in terms of policy implications, what this is, what this is um, saying is that uh, automation is going to increase output, uh, but wage rents in automated jobs lower this uh, productivity gain. And the reason is that these, these wage rents result in too few workers being employed in these automatable jobs. 
uh, such that labor productivity in those jobs is going to be too high from a social point of view. So, so you know, not thinking about automation, but just thinking about the inefficiency um, of, of these wage rents being earned. Uh, ideally, a social planner would, would um, reallocate um, um, more, um, more workers to the, the wage rent sector, because that's where jobs are, are more efficient. But of course, that, that, um, that wage premium is preventing, um, preventing um, that from, from happening in equilibrium. And so, you know, what automation is going to do is automation is going to displace these workers that are relatively efficient. Um, and so it's going to displace workers in these jobs uh, to jobs without wage, wage rent, where labor productivity is, is too low from a social point of view. And that's exactly the, the excessive displacement of labor effect that you um, is putting a drag on output growth from, from um, automation. And so wage rents can lead to even socially excessive automation um, if the output gains from automation are outweighed by the displacement of workers uh, from wage rents to other jobs. So if, if this negative effect would outweigh this, this positive productivity effect, um, then again, you know, a social planner would actually want to reduce automation. So, you know, as long as, as you know, it's, it's, it's positive, so this in absolute terms, this last term is smaller than this first term. Um, automation is increasing output and the social planner could find ways to, to redistribute this, this productivity gain if it, wish, if it wishes. But if, um, if this, this last term in absolute value is bigger than this first term, then the social planner would uh, want to uh, decrease I rather than increase it. Okay. So I've talked about three inefficiencies. So the, the technology skill mismatch, the, um, um, the uh, biased tax code in favor of capital relative to labor uh, and um, wage rents in jobs that um, are automated. And I've argued that each of these inefficiencies is um, putting a drag on um, value added output growth. And so this kind of feeds into the debate, which is a debate about a very deep puzzle of missing productivity growth. And task-based frameworks are giving several possible explanations to, to, um, to this uh, missing productivity growth. The first, which is not a very um, likely explanation, but it's, it's, it's theoretically possible at least, is that uh, technological progress has slowed down. So, you know, DI, DN, or, you know, factor augmenting technological progress um, has slowed down. That will um, reduce productivity growth, even in, in the baseline model. Two and three are about the, the changing nature of um, technological progress and how um, innovation shifting from, from automation to the creation of new labor tasks or vice versa could explain why we see uh, lower productivity growth. So two says that you know, what could have been the case is that we have uh, more automation uh, and less creation of new labor intensive tasks. And the productivity gains from um, automation are, are lower than they are from um, the creation of new labor intensive tasks. So if, for example, the, um, so, so um, if, if automation is, is um, introducing so, so technologies where we said that the productivity gains are relatively low and for some reason, innovation is shifting away from the creation of new labor tasks where productivity gains are arguably higher towards uh, more automation where the productivity gains are, are lower, then you know, that kind of composition effect could also be um, re reducing um, productivity growth. Or it could, you could also think of it the other way around. It could be that the productivity effects from automation are high, but the productivity effects from the creation of new labor tasks is low and that innovation uh, for some reason is um, shifting towards more DN and less DI. Again, that would be a change in the composition 
of innovation in terms of you know how much the i versus the n is done um, that would lower productivity growth and you know one example you could you could think of is uh, perhaps is um, you know if if we um, see a lot of innovation and creation of, of new green jobs uh, that's good for job creation but that might be um, that might not be very productive jobs or at least um, less productive than um, increases in productivity from automation. So that's all one and one, two and three are all, you know, could all be at work within the baseline model. And then I've also now um, in this section eight five listed three possible inefficiencies that could um, put a drag on productivity growth from um, automation. The first one is technology skill mismatch. We said that the more severe that is, the lower the productivity gains will be from automation. The same for um, the subsidization of capital relative to labor. If capital accumulation in the economy is, is costly uh, for some reason. And then finally, when there's wage rents for workers in automatable jobs, um, which would imply that um, these workers are displaced um, from jobs in which they have relatively high um, uh, efficiency, where the productivity is high to jobs, where, where the productivity is um, um, too low from, from a social point of view. Uh, and that would also put a drag on um, um, the gains from, from um, the gains in terms of output from automation. So to wrap up this, um, um, chapter eight. So you know, the discussions about the old automation and the future of work, um, I think lack at this stage a conceptual framework. And a task-based framework is um, a very useful way to enrich the debate that's often just either technology is all bliss or technology is um, all evil. I think you know this framework is providing a very um, rich way to think um, about the impact of automation, but also the creation of new labor tasks on labor markets in a much more nuanced way, but still very intuitive way. And so, you know, and it's just not about automation and um, the creation of new labor intensive tasks. It's also a general framework where we can still think about uh, factor augmenting technological changes different types of automation at the extensive margin, at the intensive margin. And coming back to the, the, the facts that um, we use as a motivation to go away from this, this um, more traditional uh, two-factor CRS framework, um, we, we, we can explain why the wages of some workers have declined you know, if, if um, the displacement effect is um, bigger than the, the productivity effect, then we'll actually see wages of workers being displaced declining. And um, we can also now have, have think, think sensibly about why the labor share has fallen recently. Um, and finally, it illustrates how several inefficiencies can be a, a drag on uh, productivity growth.